Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Monday, April 26th edition of uh, Track Announcer's Notebook as we continue to deal with the uh, ravages of uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, last week, of course, we had Dr. Steve Walker on a uh, very insightful and educational hour uh, spending with Steve and also had Ken McAdam on because Certainly things have been impacted in a big way here uh, in Ontario. I guess we'll know um, as we get closer to May 20th, whether or not uh, motorcycle uh, racing and track days and other activities, whether it's on or off-road, off, uh, off road, uh, are going to be allowed here in the province of Ontario. So uh, we're in that uh, hurry up and wait mode. But um, our... Uh, Pleasure to have uh, former national superbike uh, racer and uh, veteran Steve Dick as our special guest tonight. We're going to cover all kinds of topics, uh, including uh, getting the update on what uh, the motorcycle racing status is in uh, BC and how the motorcycle stores out there are doing, as we said, uh, continue to deal with COVID-19. But as always, first up, uh, my uh, co-host Stuart Nodell. We'll kick off the show with uh, Nodell's notes. Stu? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just wanted to uh, start off with the uh, AMA Supercross. And we had a new winner this past week in Salt Lake, and that was Marvin Muskin on the uh, factory KTM. And uh, it looks like the series is, I would say, a bit of a two-horse race now. Uh, Cooper Webb uh, is leading the points slightly. He's got a pretty good gap, about 27 points, I believe over uh, second place, Ken Roxon. So Eli Tomac sitting third, but he's a little ways back, almost, you know, two full rounds of races worth because it's 27 points for a win. So I, I think Eli Tomac's on the outside looking in now. Then okay. uh, the other news that we had, that was Cooper Webb again, leading the points. So, but that's from his victory in Atlanta. And they, uh, they wrap up the championship next weekend back in Salt Lake. Then uh, this coming weekend, it looks like if you're in the Georgia area, there's a lot of awesome racing happening. It's the uh, the, the American Flat Track Series is having their TT event. And uh, it looks like I think it's just about sold out. So uh, I think they're expecting a good crowd on hand and the, the race course looks awesome. Yeah, they uh, American Flat Track, uh, starting with the kickoff uh, event the half mile at Volusia County Speedway in March at Daytona they've been doing a, a great job with that uh, with that series of course uh, pretty much every motorsport event in the United States right now will have some fans uh, depending on the state and the venue uh, I've seen upwards of 30 to 40 percent of uh, the grandstand capacity and uh, for instance, uh, I think it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, they announced 135,000 would be allowed uh, for the Indy 500. That's coming up in about a month. And uh, I think most people know I'm a bit of a horse race fan. So this Saturday, the first Saturday in May, the Kentucky Derby, they're going to allow 40,000 fans at Churchill Downs, uh, masks, I think temperature checks and all that stuff. But uh, they're continuing to push ahead in the United States. And uh, I caught some of the NASCAR race from Talladega yesterday. It looked like they had a pretty good crowd there as well. Uh, it's a little different story here uh, in Canada. But uh, that should be a great Atlanta uh, Super TT event this weekend. Yeah. And then uh, also coming along in the same weekend. So uh, they're going to be at Road Atlanta for the first round of the Road America or for the uh, Moto America series. So that Superbike Championship looks to be super competitive this year with, you know, seeing as though Cameron Bobier's moved off to the Moto2 class, but uh, they kick off this weekend as well. And I think the distance is only about 80 miles, so about an hour and a half between venues. So I think if you're a racing fan, this would be a, an awesome place to be this coming weekend. Maybe Pete and Carol will be there. No, uh, I don't know if they're going to make that drive, but yeah, indeed, if you're a motorcycle racing fan and a star for live action, uh, the Atlanta area is certainly the place to be uh, this weekend. I think uh, a lot of people predicting what the championship will be like in uh, Moto America Superbike with Cameron Bobier, the multi-time champion, uh, moving over to Europe. Uh, I think we'll get uh, some indication at the opener at Road Atlanta 
uh, who the teams uh, will be vying. And I guess for Canadian fans, uh, we'll be uh, rooting for the dynamic uh, duo of Darren Marshall and Jonathan Cornwell, who we had on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago. They are, of course, uh, working with Jake Gagne on the uh, Monster Energy Yamaha. So uh, we'll be checking out the action from Road America this weekend. And Stuart and I will have a complete uh, wrap up from uh, Moto America next Monday night, maybe even get a, a rider or two. And uh, I'm sure we'll have Darren Marshall and Jonathan Cornwell uh, back on the show a little bit later on in the season. And then uh, there's a charity event with Ride for Sight, Pat, that you shared with me. So I just wanted to remind people to uh, go to their website and get involved. Yeah, I mean, if things really improve, I, I think last year they had about 100 people uh, on site, very limited. Most of the fundraising was done online. And uh, we'll continue to update the story, not just with the Ride for Sight, but all of the other charity motorcycle rides that were devastated last summer with COVID-19, uh, the Ride for Dad among those. Uh, I know they're doing an online 50-50 draw to help their fundraising, but uh, it has been certainly a tough year plus for all of the uh, charity motorcycle rides and fundraising events. And that brings us to our guest, Pat. So I'll let you take it over from here. Well, that is uh, Michelle Mercier, I believe. That's not you, Steve Dick, is it? Uh, it looks like Michelle. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that is Michelle. Stuart, I'm not sure if you've got an actual photo, but we go back. Uh, and I guess we'll start the story there and we'll jump back and forth, uh, Steve. Uh, as we were doing a little bit of homework preparing uh, for the show tonight, uh, you ran in the Daytona 200 once back in 1988, finished 24th. Uh, I think you were one of four Canadian riders in the top 25 that year. Ruben McMurder was uh, fifth. And I think Michelle Mercier, who we just saw the photo of there on the Don Nitt Suzuki, was 12th and Tommy Douglas was 13th. So uh, four Canadians in the top 25. But uh, we don't want to talk about the uh, Daytona 200 because you were only uh, 24th then. Uh, we want to talk about the very first AMA 750 Super Sport race. You made it to Victory Lane at Daytona, finished third behind Doug Poland and David Sadowski in that inaugural AMA Super Sport race. First of all, what do you remember about that race all these years later? Well, there was probably 12 to 15 of us uh, vying for second and third. And um, I remember partway through the race, um, Dave Sadowski and I uh, split a guy because of course, when you have that big of a group and we were all together, all on GSXR 750s, um, the double and triple drafting is just, it's crazy. Like you're just, you're, you're seesawing back and forth. And uh, anyway, Dave was behind me and I was coming up on, a, on, a, on another rider and I went low and Dave, unbeknownst to me, Dave went high and we went around this guy and came back together and we only realized at the last second that we were both going for the same piece of pavement. And uh, so we immediately tried to take evasive action to keep from hitting each other, but we did, we collided at flat out, we were going, 155 miles an hour and um, and our side our fairings hit and the side covers hit and we kind of both wobbled a little bit and just kept going and um, and uh, he eventually uh, pulled started to pull away a bit he didn't uh, I can't remember exactly how far he was ahead of me maybe 10 or 20 bike lengths and uh, but I think I was only a few bike lengths ahead of fourth and um, but it was quite the race. And, and actually, I didn't even realize I finished fourth because there were so many of us going across the line at the same time or finished third. Third, and yeah. And, uh, and so I come into the pits and, um, you know, everybody's coming in and the AMA uh, officials are funneling us in there. And the guy stops me and says, you, you got to go this way. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, 
what did I do? Tech right? inspection. Yeah, I'm in trouble now. And so I go down and there's more officials and they keep waving me on down and down and down. And then finally another guy says that way, right? And so I turn that way and I look and there's Victory Circle at Daytona. I'm thinking, holy shit, how'd this happen? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I finished third and um, and I remember um, Vance and Hines uh, was the sponsor of the series that year. And uh, Terry Vance, uh, I was running a Vance and Hines pipe on my bike. So Terry Vance uh, stood right beside me and uh, for the uh, photos in Victory Circle. And of course, you know, I'm 5'7". That guy's got to be 6'2 or 6'3". But uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was uh, quite something. First time to Daytona, you had uh, grown up on racetracks like Edmonton International at Westwood. Uh, what was it like there? What were your impressions going to Daytona for the first time? The the drafting was unbelievable and just the speeds, like uh, especially on the super bike, which was another, you know, 15 miles an hour faster. Um, if you got a draft going towards the chicane, you had to really look out because uh, you were going so much quicker coming in there. And and basically you'd you'd look you know, as soon as you started to roll out of the, the last banking, heading towards the chicane, you, you'd be looking for your braking markers in the chicane and, and you were there like in an instant, like it was amazing. I'd never covered so much ground so fast and trying to get used to that was, uh, was it was scary, but fun. <laughs> Um, and of course the banking, you know, when you're on the banking, you've got your head down on the, on the gas tank but you're looking up out of the corner of your helmet because that's where the track is, is that way. And it's, uh, it's odd. But it uh, is, Steve, how did you get to Daytona that year? Did you do the 5,000 K drive from Vancouver or did you fly yeah. and, and who was part of your crew that year? Well, that's funny that you asked because I had a brand new uh, 16 foot box van and we had put a, uh, taken a camper apart and put it in the first half and we put our bikes in the second half. And we, and we had bunks over the bikes and there was a crew of five of us that went down and it was just a gong show. And uh, it was fun on the way down, we fun on the way down and on the way back. But, um, but yeah, we were, uh, we were quite the crew. And uh, Bob Sweet, who was my mechanic at the time, who ended up later on becoming Gary Goodfellow's mechanic, and he's still good friends of mine. We were just uh, on holidays in Mexico together. Uh, well, he they live there now uh, for in the winter. Uh, he and his wife Lori, and um, and then come back and work. He's um, he's a BMW mechanic uh, now in Vancouver, and um, uh, yeah. So he was my mechanic and and helped me get the bikes all sorted then. And uh, we had several issues, of course, you know. Uh, super bikes were still, you know, evolving so much at that time in the sport. Um, you know, guys, um, you know, grenading motors. And uh, I think we, to make, to get proper tires for the event, we had to run an 18 inch rear and the bike came with 17s. And so we didn't have enough distance between the slick and the swing arm in one session. And I could smell rubber and what I didn't realize is the tire was growing into the swing arm at speed and, uh, and shaving off rubber on the front of the swing arm. Um, so there was all kinds of things that, uh, but our biggest issue in the, in the uh, 200 miler was my fault. I, um, we had big carburetors on it and we had to remove the fuel petcock lever. It was a big long lever on the 88 uh, GSXR. And uh, so I trade made, you know, took pains to make sure I had it in the reserve position before I took the lever off. And we left it there for the rest of the weekend. Well, I was wrong. I put it in the prime position. So we only made it, I think, I don't know, 15, 18 laps into the race. And the thing started running out of fuel. And that's what screwed us up because uh, in the closing stages of the race, um, I was following uh, Ruben. Uh, I was about, I don't know, 20 bike lengths behind Ruben, just pacing him. 
and uh, and um, so his his uh, signal guy that was giving him his times and stuff came over to my timer and said, "What lap are you guys on?" And of course, my timer said, "I have no idea." <laughs> and uh, we ended up one lap down but so we were still quick at the end of the race but we lost a whole lap due to uh, unscheduled pit stops so you ended up doing three stops for fuel rather than the regular two yeah yeah yeah, yeah so, other, otherwise you might have been right there with ruben or or certainly yeah. in the top 10 yeah would have been in the top 10 yeah, yeah. so af after that 1988 uh, Daytona outing, uh, third in Super Sport, right there, uh, 24th in uh, in Superbike, but with a pace that could have put you in the top 10. Uh, why was that the only year that you went to Daytona? Was it budget? Was it a change in, in your focus in your racing career back then? It was budget. Um, that year in 88, I spent the whole year racing, so I also did the Laguna uh, national there and I did the Sears Point National and uh, I finished I know I finished top 10 I think I finished ninth in the Laguna race and I can't remember where I finished in the uh, oh I know what happened in the super sport race at Sears Point a guy went off in front of me and um, coming out of the keyhole at the end and high sided right in front of me and so the my only way out of running over the guy was to go off into the infield and I was going way too fast and, and, and basically managed to miss the, the uh, hay bale wall and with the Armco behind it and came back onto the track where the cars end up dropping the wheels off on the inside of the next corner and high sided and crashed and broke my elbow and my uh, collarbone. So that's why I didn't do the super bike race there now that I remember, yeah. So, and then um, the following year I moved to uh, Toronto um, uh, which was closer to my daughter who was living there at the time and uh, kind of backed off on the racing thing and got a real job again and uh, and just did a little bit a uh, uh, lo little bit smaller program and uh, but then partway through the year Suzuki Canada asked for my help because um, they lost um, 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 who was riding, Miguel was riding for them at the beginning of the season and um, and then uh, hurt himself in Japan testing for the Suzuka eight hour. And then they hired Jamie James to run the um, um, Shannonville National. And I finished right behind Jamie James on my super sport bike. So then they hired me for the, for the final three rounds. Awesome. I, I say hired, but they didn't pay me. <laughs> But you got you got a ride there in '89. I want to come back and and talk about uh, what was really uh, probably your biggest win ever in that uh, era of superbike racing. Happened right at uh, Westwood. But before that, I think I'm going to go to uh, Stuart Nodell. I think Stuart we may have a question or a comment for Steve. Yeah, Pat. We just had uh, Pete uh, of Pete and Carol, Pete Sweda. She had put in the Q and A. They are in fact going to Road Atlanta this weekend. Oh, okay. Very, very good. So uh, maybe we will uh, we will get Pete on as a uh, a guest to be our uh, uh, road uh, road Atlanta reporter on the opening round of uh, the uh, AMA uh, Moto America Championship. Pete, uh, we'll talk to you later uh, about turning you in, into a correspondent for Track Announcers uh, Notebook. Um, Steve, Nick, let's go back to the uh, the the beginning uh, that uh, race with Nathan Naslin at the old Edmonton uh, International Raceway. Uh, where was that track uh, located in comparison to the the racetrack that's just north of the uh, International Airport at uh, at Leduc? Uh, it's completely on the other side of town. It was on the north side of town, so it was okay. only. About um, eight kilometers from my home in St. Albert at the time. And um, so it was just outside the city limits at the time. And of course, the city's well beyond it now. Um, it was a beautiful racetrack. Um, I'm not sure when, I think it opened in about 1966 or 67. 
And I used to go there and watch uh, Can Am races there. Um, and, and they had Formula Atlantics used to run there as, as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they um, it was a two and a half mile track, and um, it was uh, three quarters of a mile straight away. So you could get the bikes going if you did the long track, which we seldom did. Um, but if you did that, uh, you could get going. Um, you know, flat out um, going into a chicane at the end of the straightaway. There was a chicane and then uh, a hard right and another hard right. And um, I love both both tracks. But of course, by the time I started racing there in 76, there was frost heaps and, um, you know, you got air in a lot of spots. <laughs> uh, indeed. And then um, it closed, I think, in, uh, in 1982. What was the reason for the closure because you've seen so many tracks uh, close uh, during your racing career, Edmonton, then Race City, and eventually, uh, or I guess before that, Westwood, and then later on, uh, Race City. Just yeah. Urban Sprawl? Yeah, yeah, Urban Sprawl. They, um, you know, they sold it to a developer and um, it didn't take them very long. Um, you know, the pavement was gone and the houses started going up. And it was on a huge piece of property. Um, yeah, it was too bad. And so, you know, Edmonton, just as Vancouver did, spent a lot of years without a racetrack before they got another one. Yeah, indeed. So then uh, you head west to, uh, to Vancouver. Take us through the, the early years of uh, running at, uh, at Westwood and what, uh, what that was like. Well, of course, um, you know, I started going to Westwood before I moved there. So I did know the track and I knew a few of the racers and stuff. And, um, and, uh, and in fact, what it was, was at the time was Kawasaki was sponsoring me and I managed to swing a deal with the Canadian Kawasaki that they would give me a bike if I moved to Vancouver. And so that's what I did. And, um, um, and so I rode Kawasaki's for two years. I was sponsored uh, by them for two seasons. And, um, and that's actually where I met uh, Michelle for the first time. Uh, it would have been in 82. I traveled to Shubenacadie. And, um, and I'm pretty sure that's where I met Michelle Mercier for the first time racing there. And I, I don't recall what class he was right I don't think he was in Superbike then but I honestly I can't I think remember. he he started out in uh, in production on a Kawasaki 750 uh, if I uh, if I recall correctly okay yeah yeah I, I think you're right and and he might have even maybe he was allowed to even ride it in the 750 class I remember I mean the guy is such a character and you you don't go to a racetrack and not meet Michelle and not remember Michelle <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Now, for many years, uh, your Monday to Friday job was working for Herman at, uh, at Full Bore. And I, I think there was a story that you were relating to me about Herman was the guy who actually gave Michelle his start in, uh, in road racing, including at Shannonville. And I remember that race very, very well where uh, Herman rented one of Lang Hindle's Kawasaki Superbikes, and that's how Michelle got his Superbike debut at Shannonville. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Herman told me the story. I don't remember all the details, but, um, but the just of the details that I got from Herman was that there was some small issue with the bike that Lang was concerned about, but I think he had forgotten to tell uh, um, Michelle about it and um, and of course he only told Herman about it during the race and of course whatever it, the issue was that's what caused uh, uh, Michelle's crash but of course um, you know he's still Herman still had to pay for all the repairs which were extensive. Yeah I, I Lang came to the the old Honda Tower that day and uh, during that race and he was like a uh, uh, an expectant father waiting in the delivery room, pacing back and forth and uh, sort of lost it when uh, Michelle put the bike uh, on the ground. But of course, uh, after that, uh, he was uh, one of our top riders for many, many years. We'd hope uh, to get him on 
the show tonight, but unfortunately he, uh, he had some technical issues and he couldn't, uh, couldn't join us. Uh, Steve, one of the other things that you are, uh, are known for is riding a six cylinder Honda CBX. Uh, how did that ride come together and whatever gave you any idea that you'd be able to race that monster in the production classes, but you did pretty well on it. Well, first of all, you got to remember, I lived in Edmonton, so I didn't know any better. And uh, <laughs> that was well before the internet. And, uh, you know, this thing was 1,050 cc's, but you were allowed to race it in the class. I, I can't remember what the, I think they changed the rules or something. Anyway, I was allowed to race it. And, um, and uh, a very good friend of mine that uh, one of the other fellows that got me into racing um, had quit racing and now was uh, a machinist and a welder and a, um, and a millwright. And so um, we worked on that CBX. Uh, well, and actually that's where I met Bob Sweet uh, originally was, uh, he was the one of the mechanics at Alberta Cycle and he was going to be my mechanic uh, that season. That was uh, Alberta Cycle's contribution uh, besides the bike um, to uh, my support. And uh, so, um, so yeah, Bob uh, uh, did the motor work and stuff. And then uh, my other friend, Brian uh, Hansen, um, was the one who helped. We did uh, some swinger modifications. Uh, we put uh, gold wing forks on it at the time and changed the steering stem as well. And a lot of different things in it. And what's funny is that there were times when that bike handled amazingly well. It, it really did handle well. But then the next race, it would find a new hinge somewhere. And, and so we'd beef it up again where we think the hinge is. And then the next race, it would be good again. And then the next race, it'd be, it would be tank slapping down the, you know, coming out of corners and stuff. And so, but um, it was a lot of fun. It was fast, um, but um, it was a handful to hold on to. Yeah, you had to just let it slap between your legs and and you know, keep the throttle pinned and hope that you stayed on. <laughs> it was a bit of a a, a brucking bon bronco. Whatever happened to the uh, bike? Did it end up back on the street or? Um, yeah, um, guy who owned a motorcycle wrecker in Calgary bought it, and um, I think he tried to put it back into a street bike. And uh, I, if I remember right, either I can't remember if he crashed it or if he blew the motor. Um, and then I don't know whatever happened to it after that. You know. Steve, when we go back to the, uh, to the 1980s, when, uh, we truly had a national, uh, series from Westwood in the West to Atlantic Motorsport Park in the East and stops in, uh, in between, uh, Westwood was, uh, a hotbed for road racing. So many, uh, great riders that were part of the uh, of the scene out there. Uh, we'd like to take a few minutes to get your take as a fellow competitor who watched these uh, riders from the uh, Vancouver area uh, race against you and race against all of the best in Canada. Uh, let's start with uh, Gary Goodfellow. He was a uh, an ex motocrosser who you know raced at the highest level. But, uh, you know, he certainly won his share of races at uh, Westwood. What do you remember most about Gary Goodfellow? Well, um, the first time I saw him out on the track, um, I might have been practice. And then in the race, he, he crashed. One of uh, a piece came off his bike, caus causing him to crash. But I, I remember he was fast and he was quite the character. And, uh, and actually... You know, his riding style was kind of like Steve Crevier because, uh, in a sense, because he was an ex-motocrosser. And uh, he didn't care if his bike was out of shape. He didn't care if it was bouncing all over the place. He didn't care if he went off the track to try and get around somebody. Um, and, of course, you know, when you come from a predominantly road racing background like myself, where you're trying to keep it on the pavement all the time, when you're racing against somebody who doesn't care if they keep it on the pavement or not, it, it kind of, you know, it throws you for a bit of a loop, right? And, uh, and uh, you know, makes you realize, wow, there's more than one way to win a road race. 
Okay, that's good, fellow. Uh, let's talk about uh, a rider you just mentioned there, uh, Steve Crevier, because you watched his career uh, blossom right before your your very eyes as uh, you know a rookie who I think maybe spent one year in amateur and then he was sort of the uh, you know the next great Canadian rider. Yeah, he. I remember. Um, of course, I was busy. I think at the time racing three different classes uh, when he first came out, and it would have been, uh, geez, eighty four, eighty five. I think eighty four, and um, and about part way through the day, uh, somebody came over to me and and said, "Did you see that guy uh, uh, pass a bunch of guys coming out of the S's in the dirt?" And this was in, I think in the, uh, I don't think at the time it was RZ Cup, it was 400 production at yep. the time. And of course I was too busy getting my bike ready. I said, no, I didn't see that. And they said, oh no, this guy is quite amazing. And he, he, and he made the pass, he made it stick, right? And, and, uh, and his name's Steve Crevier. And so by, and in those days we used to, at the end of the day, we, we did our trophy presentations in the clubhouse. And when I got to the clubhouse, once we got all our bikes packed up and got to the clubhouse, everybody was talking about this guy, Steve Crepier. And, uh, you know, he's first time racer, like he, but he, he, uh, he certainly made a name for himself immediately, like that first race day. And uh, so I remember running into his dad, actually, his, his dad came over to me and introduced himself to me his dad, Bob, really, really super nice guy. And, um, and he, you know, announced who he was and stuff. And I said, wow, I said, you know, I haven't met your son yet, but from everything I hear, he's pretty talented. I said, you know, um, you've, you know, if I can give you some advice, I said, um, you know, keep him focused and keep him. It sounds like he's a little bit harebrained, I said. <laughs> and so, 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 you know, if you can keep him focused, obviously he's got talent. He's going to do well. And um, so, yeah, that was my advice to Bob. And I think for many years, he tried to, his best to keep Steve on the straight and narrow. And of course, you know, Steve did amazingly well. He is one of the most successful Canadian racers ever, right? And, um, and uh, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, we still see each other t from time to time. And, um, but yeah, such a funny guy and, uh, you never forget him. Once you meet him, there's no way you'll ever forget him. <laughs> oh, that, that's certainly for sure. Um, also want to talk a little bit, uh, about, uh, Tom Walther, who was an amazingly talented rider who we lost far too young, uh, with that devastating crash over, uh, in, uh, in Japan. But uh, Tom certainly won his fair share of, uh, of races and for many years was part of the, the big Superbike National that uh, ran out there at Westwood. Yeah, and, and in fact, in 87, when we lost Tom, that season, Tom and I were on the same bikes. At same, uh, we both had VFR 750 Superbikes. I don't know if he had a production bike, but we both had production 600s as well. And um, I can't remember if he had a production 750. But anyway, we battled, uh, especially in Superbike. And um, he was doing the AMAs at the time. And uh, I think that year I only did one or two. He did three or four of them. And um, he was gaining a ton of experience. He was getting some backdoor help from American Honda and because they realized his talent. And... Um, so we had a few, not too many close races because he was off doing a lot of races, the AMAs while I was doing the, um, the, the club races. And I was, as I said, I wasn't traveling as much. And then um, we had the national in, in 87 and um, there in July. And it was Tom and I that, uh, that battled from first lap to the last and we, um, apparently we were breaking the lap record every single lap. We were chasing each other so hard. Um, yeah. It was, uh, so we, and, and of course, during that year, we had traveled together to a few races. We traveled together to California and stuff. So we had become really close, um, you know, good friends. And, uh, and in fact, um, 
in October, uh, he went to in early October, uh, well, sorry, was actually late October, 23rd is when he had his accident. Uh, he was um, he was in Japan, obviously at Mount Fuji circuit. And he and I were meeting the following weekend. He was going straight from Japan and I was flying from Vancouver and we were doing an invitational race, which was basically one of the first sort of quasi world superbike races. World Superbike started in the spring of 88. And this was a three race series in the fall of 87 in uh, South Africa. Um, and um, uh, a lot of top name uh, racers were there at the, at the series. So, so I'm anxiously, you know, anticipating this, uh, this race. This is the first time I've really been out, outside of North America racing. And, um, and I remember um, uh, his, my roommate at the time was a very close friend of his as well, a, a woman, um, real uh, close friend of mine, both of us. And, uh, she was listening to the radio and I heard her scream and, and start crying. And I was like, what is going on? And I believe this was on the Saturday morning or Friday morning, um, because of course they're a day ahead of us there. And, um, and it, there was the news over the radio that Tom had been killed yeah. and um, pretty devastating. Yeah, indeed, it was for the uh, the entire Canadian uh, motorcycle racing uh, community. Yeah. Uh, gone far, uh, far too uh, too soon. Uh, yeah. Did you end up going to the race in uh, South Africa? I did. <clears throat> um, it was a lot of fun. I um, met a lot of people. There was a lot of people there. Uh, Robert Holden was there. Who uh, Gary Goodfellow had brought Robert Holden over in 83 or 84 to race against me. Um, and when Gary was uh, hurt and concentrating on more on his business, um, there's several people that I knew from the AMA nationals and stuff as well that were there. So it was, it was, um, it was pretty neat. I got to meet um, Joey Dunlop. Uh, funny story. There was about five or six of us standing around in a circle in the, in the pits in Kalami, and um, Joey's telling a story, and we're all English speakers, and uh, <clears throat> all of us are looking around at each other, like, you know, do you understand what he's saying? Like, we, we about every fourth word, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I recognize that word, but we could barely understand anything that he said. We and, needed Pat Barnes at that time to translate, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, like quite a few characters there. Freddie Merkel was there. Um, um, uh, Joey um, um, McDowan was there. Uh, Mike Dawson was there. Um, a lot of the top racers at the time from all around the world were there. Yeah, and um, it was it was fun. Yeah, and that was sort of the. Uh, the event that uh, would sort of foreshadow the first year of World Superbike in 1988. And I had the good fortune of going to Donington Park for the very first World Superbike uh, race uh, the wow. following year in 88. It was pretty cool. I think Gary was there. Michelle Mercier, Ruben uh, was, uh, was quite the, uh, the, the trip over there, Brands Hatch and, uh, and Donington Park. Steve, I want to come back and talk to you about uh, what I consider your shining moment in Canadian superbike history when you uh, just totally obliterated the competition in the wet in 1989 in the superbike race there at Westwood. But before that, Stuart Nodell, I think we might have uh, another couple of questions or comments for Steve. Yeah, we do, Pat. It's more of a, a comment, uh, and it comes from Nathan Aslan talking about the International Speedway, how it was a great place to be racing in the mid to late 70s. Steve Dick, Brian Smith, Brian Harrison, Bruce Chirwanka, and Jim Fahey, Warren McKinnon, to name a few, were all part of the Alberta Road Racing Club. And their club put on some great parties, and he sure, Steve, will remember them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> remember those, Steve? Adult oh, yeah. beverages? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we had really good parties. 
<laughs> and what about the Westwood uh, Motorcycle Racing Club? It has uh, continued on beyond the closure of uh, the Westwood track. Uh, you now race out at, uh, at Mission. Uh, what has been, I uh, guess, we're coming up on uh, a little over three decades since uh, Westwood closed. What's, uh, what's the racing like at, uh, at Mission these days? It's quite competitive. Um, the um, uh, one of the front runners there um, was a couple of the front runners there are very fast in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so as the same as it was in the in the eighties, where um, you know us uh, riders from Westwood would go down and kick butt in Washington State and even um, uh, California. Um, at some of the venues um, is still going on. Um, so um, they still, uh, you know, at, at um, Seattle and uh, Portland, when the Canadians show up, they're like, oh God, again? <laughs> but the borders uh, are, I, I take it not too many of the BC riders are, are, have been racing there since last year. No, there was no racing this past. In fact, Mission uh, was closed last year. Um, they found out only after the season was over that they didn't have to. They could have been running uh, because we had fairly relaxed um, uh, situation here in BC with Bonnie Henry looking after things. Um, we didn't do too bad until this new variant uh, uh, came upon us. So, um, but yeah, the um, the car club that runs the races out there misunderstood the. Um, the direction from um, uh, from the health authority, and uh, they ran no races out there last year whatsoever, um, which is uh, uh, pretty sad. And now this year, of course, with the new variants, it's been delayed again. But they n at least know that uh, under certain protocols, once they're given the green light, they are allowed to hold events without spectators. So, so they should be racing this year, hopefully. Well, that's good. I know uh, you live very close to Area 27. You've got a membership there and you get out not only on two wheels, but on uh, on four wheels as well. Uh, what's it like being a member at uh, Area 27 and how, how often are you on track? Well, I don't go up nearly as often as I would like. I'm probably there five times a season. Um, and so um, my car is semi-track, uh, trackable. And so as, as um, um, uh, the president of the, uh, of the uh, Area 27 Association says, uh, uh, I'm the only um, uh, member that takes their track machine out and then takes the tow machine out. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it's fun. It's, uh, it's an amazing track. It has, uh, it's uh, almost five kilometers long, 4.85 kilometers, so three miles. It's got a 300 feet of elevation change per lap, 16 corners, um, designed by Jacques Villeneuve um, and Bill um, uh, Drossos, who's the president, and as well as um, Trevor Siebert, uh, who built, who actually physically built the track. And between the three of them, those, those three actually met at a driving school uh, back in their late teens and have remained friends ever since. And that's uh, how they ended up teaming up for this effort in building Area 27. So they designed the track together, but of course uh, Jacques uh, put in several corners uh, that are his favorite corners at different tracks from around the world. And, um, but he didn't want it spoiled with uh, paved runoff like all the modern racetracks, which of course make them safer for, for two wheels and four wheels. But, you know, he wanted this track to feel like you were driving out on your favorite country road. And, um, and it is still safe in my opinion. And, uh, but if you go off, chances are you're, if you're on a bike, you're not gonna keep it up. Um, but, uh, you know, the consequences aren't too bad. And, uh, in a car though, uh, well, there is, there has been some casualties in a car, not, not, uh, not physical casualties, just the cars. There's, uh, the membership, you know, is quite well to do because currently it costs 65,000 for a membership. 
So the most of the people running out there have pretty expensive cars. And uh, when they go off the track, um, they don't look so pretty when they uh, when they're done. So um, there's been several, you know, three hundred thousand and half million dollar plus cars written off out there. Ouch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's amazing track. Four kilometers from where I live, I can show up 14 days out of the month if I want and just ride and or drive. And uh, it's a really nice uh, atmosphere out there. There's now a go-kart track there as well, which is open to the general public. And the, um, it, it was designed with spectating in mind as well. Uh, so there's several areas that make really good viewing. Um, it's, it's, it's paradise. It's paradise within a paradise. Yeah, I know Jordan Zolk was out there a couple of years ago to check out the racetrack hopefully for a CSBK national down the road. I know Ben Young uh, was out there doing some laps last year as well. Uh, yeah. What are the odds that in the next, say, five years, we'll see a CSBK national uh, back in British Columbia? Well, I would like to think it would happen. It's going to require um, some serious money. Somebody's got to come up with about 100K. Um, and... Because the track is privately owned, basically, it's, uh, you know, it, it has 345 odd members. Um, you know, the membership is not going to pay the bill to put on a national race. In fact, they've never had uh, any racing there other than what they call club racing for the members, um, which is more of a club level thing. Um, they run a GTU class and they run a stock car class and they run a uh, radicals class. And they do that about four or five times a season. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's just that it's, it's like club level racing and it's all friends and buddies just trying to beat each other. And, uh, but that's, as, that's it. There's no actual outside entity that's coming in and running races there. Um, there's a few outfits that run track days, both for cars and for bikes. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, um, so, um, you know, our, our motorcycle industry is certainly getting healthy now, uh, these days. Um, unfortunately, sport bikes aren't really a big part of the market these days, uh, in fact, somebody just told me recently that um, they don't even offer 600 sport bikes anymore. It's all leader bikes. I guess for 2021, I think, I think I somebody told me that um, for sure Suzuki, uh, Yamaha, and Honda don't even have 600s anymore. Yeah, uh, and so it's kind of shocking, but um, but it's it's certainly a beautiful venue and um if we could get some outside support and have a race out there it would be amazing it would be absolutely amazing steve i want to uh go back to 1989 and we've been sort of hopping around here over the last hour uh yeah. what i call your your shining moment because uh there's certain races that stick in your mind even though they were uh over 30 years ago that were very wet sunday at westwood i think about a year before the track closed the superbike final you were on a suzuki had these michelin rain tires and you just opened up a lead and nobody even got close to you it was your one national win there in 1989 Tell us what you remember about that race. And I think there's a story about you working with Mike Crompton and you made a call on the front Michelin rain tire that made all the difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to back up one race. So um, Jamie James rode that bike in the national at, um, at um, uh, Shannonville uh, in July. And then uh, the series came out to uh, Calgary and they asked me to, Suzuki Canada asked me to ride the bike and uh, Jamie, Jamie was tied up. And um, so, and Jamie James at that time, even though he became Superbike champion a year or two later in the US, had a very odd setup that he preferred on the bike. And for me, it was un, almost unrideable. 
And so I came in from the very first session that I rode the bike at to Calgary and I said to Mike Crompton, I said, Mike, we need to change this and this and this and this and this and this. And he said, pick one. <laughs> that sounds like Crompton. <laughs> yeah. And so, so by the end of the weekend, by the race, the bike was actually set up the way I liked it, right? But I didn't have enough time at speed and I think I finished fourth or something in the race. And uh, so anyway, by the time we got to Westwood, the bike was set up properly. And um, in the heat races on the Saturday, I can't remember, I think I finished fourth in the heat race too. I can't remember for sure. And then on the Sunday, it started raining. And, um, and then Tommy Douglas crashed his 600 in the 600 race, picked it up and did two full laps leaking oil all over the track. And so that, uh, help things quite a bit. And um, so, uh, and I'm trying to think, I think we did get practice before the track got oiled in the morning. And, uh, and so uh, Mike had put the rain tires on it. He hadn't done anything else. I took it out, did a few laps and practice and came in and I gave him a list of like six things to do to it. And he was scratching his head and he said to me, Steve, I am only doing this because you are supposed to be the rain god here because there is no way I would normally ever make this many changes to a bike. And the one that really got him was I asked him to put the front Michelin rain on backwards. And he's like, I, I don't, okay, I, I don't even want to ask why. And so, but anyway, I knew the, these tires were, had already been scrubbed at uh, the Shuby National by, um, um, uh, Miguel, yeah, and uh, so they were pre-scrubbed, which is great. And um, so, uh, so anyway, the idea was that the the Michelin Rain at the time was a Chevron pattern, much like the uh, Metzler laser tires uh, of the day. But Michelin chose to run their pattern backwards, so that if you locked the front, it would pull the water up right underneath the center contact patch and the thing you would just lose the front and crash. So I said, no, I want it on backwards because I know uh, with the oil out there and stuff like that, I might be locking the front a few times and I don't want to crash. And, um, and, and, uh, he, and so we talked about it a little bit and, and, um, and anyway, I realized that it was going to make the cornering slipperier because the, the way the tread blocks uh, went away from the center of the contact patch, it would make it a little more slippery in the in cornering grip, but the, the straight up and down grip would be best. So, so anyway, so, um, so I got, he did all the changes I asked. Uh, they uh, spent an hour cleaning the track and, and uh, sweeping it everywhere and getting as much oil off as they could. And then they let us out for two uh, sighting laps, all us super bike riders and, um, and uh, near the end of the second lap, this is before lap or before uh, tire warmers, I was already starting to test the level of grip and it was actually surprisingly good. So uh, then they let us out. So they all, we all came in, they wanted to talk to each one of us and make sure there was a few riders that were still pretty hesitant because you could see the rainbows everywhere, you know, from the running water it was still raining. And so we went out for another two laps and uh, it was on that the second lap of, so my, my uh, fourth lap out there now, I'm braking so hard, I'm getting the back wheel off the ground. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is great. This is exactly the way I want it, right? Everything was working perfect. The gear shifts were in the right spot because I had gotten Mike to shorten the gearing a bit. It had more mid-range torque because I got him to fatten up the needles a little bit. And, and the bike, I could tell the bike was going to be good. And um, so then they sent us out for one more warm up, our final warm up lap. And then it was, a, it was the green flag. And, um, and I think Michelle actually got the whole shot and, um, and got out in front into turn one. And I, I think I, I went around, I think I tried to get around the outside of him in turn two. And then we went down together through turn three. And then I knew I had so much grip and I got on the gas and just started feathering it and sliding all the way down the hill through three. 
and up over Deer's Leap. And when I went up over Deer's Leap, I never realized this before because I never had such a powerful bike before. But Deer's Leap actually had a bit of a lip and then a bit of a shallow spot and then another lip. And when it went over the first lip, it got a bit light and it spun, the back wheel spun and it spun all the way down into the hairpin. So of course I smiled in my helmet and I, I said to myself, well, Stevie, you know how to fix that. So next time over the leap, I just sat up a little bit going over the leap and it lifted the front and I wheelied all the way down the hill into the hairpin. And so I did that every lap. I just wheelied all the way down. And cause that way, all the weights on the back wheel and it wasn't spinning, right? And, um, and I remember Mike after the race, he, um, he was telling me he, he's watching and, and on the first lap by first pass, I was, it was 12 second gap between me and second place, which was Michelle. And then on the second lap, there was 18 seconds. And so Mike is cussing and swearing to himself because he's thinking, obviously there's been a red flag and I haven't seen the flag, right? Like there's just no way that I could have that much lead. But then lap three goes by and I, and I've eased off the pace a bit. And then he realizes, Hey, we're winning, we're winning. And, um, so yeah, I, it was so much fun that race. It was, I could slide that thing at will, like down through turn three and up through the S's and get the back wheel off the ground coming into turn one and coming into the hairpin. It was, it was like I could do no wrong. And uh, I think I ended up finishing 12 seconds ahead of Michelle. And then the, the real highlight was <laughs> when we we're in, in, uh, in basically in victory circle there, they were going to give us a ride around in a pickup truck. And, but anyway, we got the, there was the three bikes in the, um, in the, um, uh, you know, in, in the victory circle. And they were, uh, I think you were probably there getting ready to do interviews. And, um, and Gary says to me, who won? <laughs> and of course, I took great pleasure in saying I did. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was uh, uh, an amazing ride. Were you always uh, a confident rider and, and were almost happy when uh, the track was wet that that gave you an advantage? And, and, and how did you develop that, uh, that skill? Uh, from Westwood. It, we used to call it wetwood. Um, you know, in spring and fall, it would always be wet. And, uh, you know, I am a fairly smooth rider. And of course, riding in the rain is, you know, it's certainly advantageous to be smooth. And also the, what, what really taught, you know, you had asked earlier why Westwood produced so many uh, fast racers. Because of all the elevation changes, both on camber and off camber and uphill and downhill at Westwood, is you really learned how to use elevation to your advantage to gain grip and when you were losing grip. And, you know, in, in say off camber corners or downhills, you could actually slide the back, uh, you know, and help you turn, uh, you know, through the curve and stuff like that. And it had a little bit of everything enough to really, if you were fast at Westwood, you seemed to be able to go fast anywhere. And uh, so between, you know, that and, and, you know, all the rain races we had, um, yeah, I just developed a, a good skill for, for riding in the rain. And, and still Steve, to this day, I enjoy it. I, yeah. It's pretty in my car. <laughs> you would not want to be driving with me on Highway 3 in the rain in my car. It's, I have so much fun. <laughs> with or without Michelin rain tires mounted backwards. Exactly. <laughs> without, without. Yeah. But I, Continentals are my tire of choice now for my rain tire on my car. <laughs> okay. Steve, I know Monday to Friday, you're busy working for Gamma Sales, one of the uh, aftermarket uh, distributors. Uh, what's it like in, uh, in 2021 uh, on your Monday to Friday job? And what's the health of uh, the British Columbia uh, motorcycle uh, dealer network from, from what you're seeing and, uh, and hearing? because motorcycle sales are, are up nicely overall for the first three months of, uh, of this year. Yeah, my, um, my top dealers are up, uh, some of them almost double. Wow. They, they have never had such a good season ever. 
Um, even last year, uh, starting like we had, um, you know, in March when things really kind of the, the shit hit the fan, so to speak, um, you know, dealers thought there was some, I had some dealers that had just bought dealerships. I had some dealers that had just moved into new buildings and, and COVID hit and uh, for about a week, everybody, there was some stores that closed even though they didn't actually need to. Um, and we thought doom and gloom and uh, uh, some dealers, uh, I think uh, around the, oh, would have been about the 25th to the 30th of March, uh, opened up again, or they were at work, and the phone started ringing, and it hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped. They um, they can't keep units in stock. They can't like. It's ridiculous. My my sales personally in the last three months are up two hundred percent. Wow. I'm doing double what I did last year. Um, and over the over the year, I'm up sixty two percent. Uh, in the last 12 months, and um, and uh, but it's it's across the country. I I think, at least from my perspective, that BC is leading the increase. But uh, all across the country, all the power sports stores are doing well. And um, if you're a motorcyclist or an ATV or or anything power sports, and you're thinking of buying a new unit, and you haven't uh, gone and put money down on it now yet do it now because and chances are you're going to have to wait um i've been at stores where um where the parts guy is selling a unit because this other sales guy is too busy and and he's telling this guy that it's going to be four months yeah i can take your deposit i need this much down and uh, i'm pretty sure we're going to have one of those for you in four months and the and the guys well do you want me to pay all of it can i i can pay all of it if you want like, 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 because they've been to other stores and realized this is the first guy that's actually said he might get him a unit. Right? Steve, yeah, yeah, I'm hearing that story. Inventory is the uh, the issue with uh, a lot of power sports dealers. Yeah. Steve, you've done uh, an awful lot uh, in motorcycling, both on the business side, working for various. Uh, uh, aftermarket companies you've done all kinds of racing uh is there still something in uh in motorcycle uh racing or in the motorcycle uh, industry that uh you still have to get accomplished before you look at or even entertain retiring um well the one thing that i've never been able to uh accomplish very well is riding my dirt bike slow in the woods I'm from years of road racing and that's where I started is I'm used to the gyro and that's why I, you know in the rain like I have no problem sliding both wheels in the rain because I got those gyros you know and and I know how to control it and uh, I have a dirt bike now I got an adventure bike um, and um, on my dirt bike I'm terrible when the going gets slow and the, and it's you know climbing we got a lot of mountains here and stuff and so what I would really like to do is get myself a trials bike. And then I'd like to have a serious talk with Jordan Zoke. All right. Because that guy is, is amazing at everything he does. And I would like to get some pointers from him on, on how to do well going so darn slow. Because he's, he's good at it. Well, he's, he, he knows how to do it at either end of the continuum, slow yep. and fast. Stuart yep. Nodell, I think we may have one final question or comment for Steve Dick before we wrap up the show? Yeah, just a couple things. Actually, the one comment was get a trials bike. So Steve sort of took care of that and answered his own question. And also just wanted to let Steve know, Bruce Schulten sent me a message earlier today and he's from the Pacific Northwest and remembers you fondly racing against a lot of the guys you mentioned up in the uh, Seattle area. So just wanted to send you his best. Oh, thanks. Yeah, cool. Uh well, on, uh, on that note, Steve, our hour has gone by. It's been awesome taking a little walk down uh, memory lane and getting your take uh, and hearing uh, really some great uh, stories that we've, you've been able to share with our, uh, with our audience uh, tonight about your road racing career. Um, hopefully by next year at this time, this uh, COVID situation is in the rearview mirror. 
Uh, I know I've got uh, plans to get out to Vancouver to not only uh, visit my daughter who lives there, but also I know Daryl Fletcher uh, has been working on getting Steve Crevier inducted into the BC Sports Hall of Fame. A lot of that's been delayed due to COVID-19, but uh, uh, if that happens next year, then uh, I hope to be able to get out there and maybe you and I can take a drive up, not in your car, in my <laughs> rental, to Westwood uh, to take a look at that racetrack. Uh, again, I was there about three years ago and uh, it brought back, as I'm sure it will for you, some very sweet memories, including that uh, Sunday in the wet when you put that front tire on backwards and smoked them all to take the win. And uh, the first time I think Crompton's ever made six changes on a bike for anybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, it was really good. And I, uh, I know you're hoping to get Michelle on uh, later this year as well and, and the next few months. And I would love to, uh, to trade stories with him too. Okay. We, well, well, well right. When we get Michelle back on, maybe we'll have you do a, a cameo on that show. Uh, Stuart Nodell, uh, we'll give you the final word here. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just want to thank you and Steve. It was really insightful and great to hear all these stories of the past. Steve was obviously a great rider in the Canadian series, but it's always great to hear the stories kind of behind the scenes. Um, so this was a lot of fun. And just want to remind everyone that the, the show is recorded and we will post it up on our YouTube channel uh, by this Thursday on uh, the Track Announcer's Notebook. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to it. That way you're notified anytime a new video does get posted. Okay, great. Uh, again, our thanks to uh, everyone for joining us here on the show. Uh, Pete and Carol, enjoy the trip to uh, Road Atlanta. We'll talk to you about uh, hopping on here and giving us a firsthand rundown of uh, what you uh, saw at Road Atlanta coming up this weekend. And uh, we'll have uh, some other guests besides uh, Pete on the show next uh, Monday night. Uh, Steve, thanks again. Uh, ride safe and enjoy those uh, days at uh, Area uh, 27. Thanks, Pat. Thanks very much. And thank you too, Stuart. And uh, Nathan, hello. And uh, everybody who's been watching tonight, uh, thanks a lot. Great, Steve. Be well. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Have a safe week. And we'll see you back here next Monday night on uh, Track Announcer's Notebook.